Rudy Tanzi is the Joseph and Rose Kennedy Professor of Neuro Neurology at Harvard University and the Director of the Genetics and Aging Research Unit at Massachusetts General Hospital. He has been investigating the genetics of neurological disease since a student in the 1980s when he participated in the first study that used genetic markers to find a disease gene. Tanzi co-discovered all three familial early onset Alzheimer's disease genes and several other neurological disease genes, including that responsible for Wilson's disease. As the leader of the Cure Alzheimer's Fund, um, Alzheimer's Genome Project, Tanzi has carried out multiple genome-wide association studies of thousands of Alzheimer's families leading to the identification of novel Alzheimer's disease candidate genes. His research on the role of zinc and copper in Alzheimer's disease has led to clinical trials at Prana Biotechnology. He is also working on gamma secretase modulators um, for the prevention and treatment of Alzheimer's. Thank you. It's an honor to have you with us. <clears throat> I guess this is working. So I guess this um, would begin the neurotech side of the meeting. I'm not really a digital person. I'll talk a little bit about digital stuff. but. Uh, what I'll do uh, now is talk about Alzheimer's disease and give you a little bit of a different uh, flavor for how we're thinking about Alzheimer's and with the goal of ending this disease. I, we want to help patients with this disease, but for generations coming up, I think we're very close now on the brink of coming up with ways to eradicate this disease through early detection, early intervention. So that'll be the theme. And I'll be focusing on what we've learned from genes, why the cells in your brain known as glia especially microglia, are the real battleground for this disease, and um, the role of germs. I like, like G's, genes, glia, and germs. So I'll be talking about the role of microbes in driving this disease. So Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia in the elderly. Five million patients in this country. That's going to triple by 2050. Um, but here's the thing. If you take the number of people who have Alzheimer's pathology in their brain and are at very high risk for dementia, 5, 10, 15 years from now, that number goes up to at least 20 million. And by cancer standards, right, if you have a neoplastic cell without symptoms, you have cancer. If you have heart disease without a um, heart attack or congestive heart failure, you have heart disease. Alzheimer's, we wait till symptoms. Think about how crazy that is. We wait till your brain degenerates to the point that you're demented, and we say, now we're going to treat you. That's like going to a doc only after you have a heart attack and congestive heart failure, you say, now we're going to treat you for heart failure, or even worse, with cancer. So this is what we have to change, and we're on the brink of doing so. Risk, age is number one, family history, head injury, stroke, high blood pressure. Um, it says uh, gender there because it's, females get it more than males. We're, t we're told we're not supposed to say gender anymore, we're supposed to say sex. I'm afraid that people think is a sex is a risk factor for Alzheimer's, and that's a bad message. So I'm not going to say that. So I'll just explain why I use the word gender. Um, uh, women make up two-thirds of Alzheimer's patients, and women make up over two-thirds of Alzheimer's caregivers. So this is really a disease that impacts women much more than men. And, and, epi and it's, this is an epidemic. 30 to 40 percent of people over 85 have the disease with symptoms. Current lifespan is already 80 years old. So you know, if we don't do something about this, we're going to have uh, 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 just a, a, a true uh, epidemic on our hands has already begun. So I like to quote um, one of my favorite movies, Chief Brody from Jaws, we're going to need a bigger boat uh, because we're really not doing well enough right now with current drugs that only treat the symptoms and do not treat the disease. So Alzheimer described this disease um, back in 1906. He worked at Ehrenschloss, the castle of the insane. They weren't so uh, careful with names of places back then. Um, and uh, this was a 55-year-old woman, August Dieter, admitted to the uh, a Bavarian asylum uh, with memory loss, hallucinations, and screaming for hours in the middle of the night. So he finds her sitting in his journal. He writes, he finds her sitting in her bed, says to her, what's your name? August. What's your husband's name? I believe August. Um, so she's confused. And he says, where are you right now? And this is what's telling. She said, here and everywhere, here and now. Now, I write books with Deepak Chopra. If he says that, it's OK. If she says that, it's not. Because the difference is, it's one thing to you know, be mindful, practice, meditate, and, and have that feeling of here and now. But if you cannot connect it to a person, if you cannot connect it to who you are, that's horrifying, terrifying. So in this disease, it's really loss of self. And at night, she would cry over and over, oh, God, I have lost myself. And that's really what this disease is. So this is the hippocampus. This is the main area affected in Alzheimer's. This is a mouse hippocampus uh, that you're looking into. This is where short-term memory occurs. So 
all day, even though you're getting long-term memories, your brain stem is trying to get you in trouble, you live in your midbrain, uh, where the hippocampus is, and everything that you, want, you desire or you try to avoid, fears, desires, they're all working all the time emotionally to determine how you're acting during the day with short-term memory. It's in this area that really you process most of your daily information that's coming in. So with normal cognition, your, your senses are bringing in signals, sensory signals electronically, and then they're received and recorded eventually by the hippocampus. Hippocampus means seahorse in Greek because it looks like that. Um, and then these sensory signals have to be integrated with what you already know. So if a, if a baby, a little baby sees a red shoe, the baby doesn't know it's a shoe, it sees a color, doesn't know it's red, it's just this thing. Whereas if you see a red shoe, you say, oh, a red shoe, and you, 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 make, you have context about who might wear that red shoe. That's because you already have information that the signals come in and um, uh, associate with. Um, and then this new information is, is, is stored and then later recalled as short-term memory. Eventually that which is repeated the most becomes long-term memory. And Alzheimer's, is, is, okay, so let me start with this. I just like this video. No, um, but as you watch this, how many of you can actually feel the thud as it lands and almost hear the sound? See, your brain's doing that for you. That's context. That's, that's where you're taking in just a video signal and in, and, and in this case, I don't need the sound to work. <laughs> so, you know, but you can, you, can, you can sense, you can actually feel it because you know what that should feel like if a tower was actually jumping up and down like that in the land right next to you, right? So, in Alzheimer's disease, it's this type of connection that's lost. And don't worry, if you didn't feel the thud, you don't have Alzheimer's disease. Um, so, so, the sensory signals are coming in, they're actually received and recorded, but they cannot be fully integrated and put into context with previous knowledge. So you cannot turn it into new information. So for example, an Alzheimer's patient might go to the fridge and there may be rotten leftovers and they smell them, but they, they don't make the connection that food that smells like that should not be eaten. So they may eat it, right? That, that connectivity, which you already know, turning signals into, into information is gone. And that gradual loss of connection with the world through your sensory signals and information leads to loss of self, and that's what Artist Dito is experiencing. So now, since 1906, since Alzheimer, you know, he described the pathology for the first time. Uh, he was in an amphitheater presenting this, and actually Carl Jung was in the audience, and he said, I see these plaques, these big uh, uh, sticky boulders outside of, of the nerve cells. I see inside of neurons, there's tangles, which are, which are choking the neurons from inside and killing them. And he saw neuroinflammation. He saw the glial cells of the brain activated. And he said, I think this has something to do with why she's demented. And believe it or not, nobody bought it. At that time, to say a, a, a psychiatric illness was due to physical changes was just paradigm changing. So his, his talk didn't go over that well. Well, for, eight, for, for, for 80 years or so, we guessed about what causes the disease. And that changed in 1987 when um, when we, including myself as a student at Harvard, discovered the first Alzheimer's gene, I named it amyloid precursor protein, APP, and then we discovered the presenilins with, uh, with other uh, investigators, and then at Duke University, they discovered APOE. So we suddenly had four Alzheimer's genes. The first three, APP, presenilin 1, presenilin 2, have mutations that guarantee early onset. Your lifestyle doesn't matter. You will get the disease usually under 60 years old. They're rare, 1% of cases. 300 mutations in those three genes, most of them are pre one one. The odds are when you get a patient into the clinic with onset under 60, um, um, that, that with a family history, it's probably a pre one uh, mutation. And by the way, August Dieter, Alzheimer's first patient, had a pre one one mutation. Um, and if you ever saw um, the movie Still Alice by uh, my, my ex-classmate, Lisa Genova, uh, we, we, we gave Alice the same mutation as August. So this mutation in pre one one is has made it around. Um, now, all of those genes have in common that they increase the accumulation of amyloid beta. Amyloid beta is the sticky material that makes up the plaque. And it does it in different ways. The early onset mutations actually lead to more seeding of amyloid because you make a longer form of the amyloid beta peptide that's 42 amino acids long. The normal version is 40. And that longer 42 version seeds the amyloid rapidly. So that's why they get early onset. APOE, uh, doesn't guarantee the disease. You can get your APOE genotype from a 23andMe test. They just kind of leave you to figure it out. Um, 
And uh, a, a one copy of the ApoE4 variant increases your risk about fourfold, two copies over tenfold, but they don't guarantee the disease because other genetic factors, as I'll tell you, we know 40 different Alzheimer's genes now beyond these four that can either increase your risk or mitigate risk and protect you. So when you get an ApoE4 reading that says you're positive, you have to take that into account with other genetic findings, which is still not available for testing. Uh, also, your lifestyle, as I'll tell you at the end, matters a lot with ApoE. So this is, uh, here's your pathologies. This is just showing how the amyloid beta protein is released from the precursor, APP. Um, is there a, oh, good. So here's APP. A beta is released from that. The tangles are made up of this protein called tau. Now, the big question for a long time was, does the amyloid cause the disease? The first four genes say amyloid causes the disease, and this led to the amyloid hypothesis, that amyloid triggers the disease. But for that to be, show, for that to be uh, the, the case, you have to show that amyloid causes the other pathologies, like the tangles. And what happened was, so this was the big question, do uh, plaques actually lead to tangles? And so we did these experiments in mice. You put these Alzheimer's genes into mice, you put the mutations in, they make plaques. But this is what happened. Here's the mouse telling you himself. My brain has lots of amyloid plaques, but no tangles. So for 20 years, grown people at meetings yelled and screamed at each other, like, like a bad Miller Lite commercial. It's the plaques, it's the tangles, it's the plaques. And everybody thought about it because the mice had plaques but didn't get tangles, suggesting maybe amyloid didn't cause the disease. Some of us thought since then that it's very simple. We're not mice. You know, we don't look like that. By the way, I'm not allowed to use this at a TED talk because Disney owns the, the image. I found that out at the hard way. Um, <laughs> but anyway, we're not mice. So what we did was we created something called Alzheimer's in a Dish. This was Du Yan Kim, very talented scientist in my group. What you're looking at is a human brain organoid where we take stem cells and turn them into neurons and those neurons are growing in a little ball of gel. Your, you know, your brain's like jello held by your skull. And these neurons start interacting and talking to each other. Then we can put the Alzheimer's genes into those neurons, have them make amyloid in, in the, the milieu of a brain organoid and say, what happens? And this is what happens. Here's, here's, here's the setup. What we see is that after four weeks, we get full-blown plaques in the, in the mini brain organoid. These neurons around it start to die. But before that, about two weeks after the plaques, we see the tangles appear, actual uh, you know, bona fide tangles you would see in the brain. So once we get out of the mouse and into organoids, here was the first proof of concept that says plaques lead to tangles. And I won't show you the data, but we also showed that if we stop the plaques with different drugs in the dish, then you don't get the tangles. Stop the plaques, you don't get the tangles. So this was a paper we published in Nature back in 2014, and I think to a large extent, it resolved the debate that once you get out of mice, and now we figured out why the mice don't get the tangles. It has to do with the different type of tau protein they make. I won't get bogged down with the details. So here's your Alzheimer's in a dish. Here's your plaques. Here's your tangle. That means all we have to do to treat this disease is just stop the plaques and we stop Alzheimer's, right? So how many of you have read about all the failures of trials aimed at plaques that have failed in Alzheimer's disease? Raise your hand. Yeah, it's like common knowledge. Most of the trials target plaques. They all fail. The reason is why. And you'll, you'll hear more about this from uh, Keith later on, who's, who's doing the imaging studies. I don't know if Keith is here yet. Um, but basically, whether you're trying to turn off the amyloid production, you know, turn off the spigot with things like beta secretase inhibitors or anti-aggregation drugs, or you're trying to clear the amyloid from the brain, you know, uh, uh, unclog the drain. Here's the brain overflowing with amyloid with things like immunotherapies. Everything failed. Right? You're starting to get some glimmers now of some possible hope because what we figured out is that plaques start very, very early. So here's plaque coming up, coming up, coming up. By the time you get here to mild cognitive impairment or dementia, the plaques have already accumulated and more or less peaked and plateaued. So think about what we're doing. We were taking patients who were here and stopping an event that began down here. Now we know that there's a temporal cascade. The plaques cause the tangles. As I'll tell you later on, you can live with a brain full of plaques and tangles. Even the plaques and tangles don't directly cause the disease. It's the neuroinflammation caused by that, but we'll get to that in a moment. So this all says that we have to treat the plaques very early 
in the disease, preferably 15, 20 years before. You're going to see lots from Keith on imaging a plaque in the brain. Blood tests are also on the way. So now we're seeing drugs, again, to hit plaques, like beta secretase inhibitors, which have had a lot of off-target effects, so I'm not sure if they're going to be viable. We're working on what are called allosteric gamma secretase modulators to block A beta. So far, we think that these are going to be safer. We're headed toward a, a phase one trial next year. And then we have a whole slew of different immunotherapies, aducanumab from Biogen being most uh, visible. They also had the band 2401. And they're starting to see some glimmer that if you use very early mild cases, you can start to see cognitive uh, improvements. It's not definitive yet. Jury's still out. I still think in the end, for amyloid drugs, you're going to have to do early detection, early intervention. You're going to have to detect these plaques long before symptoms of dementia and start treating then. And that means you're going to need to go beyond brain imaging, uh, and blood tests are on the way at Wash U, Randy Bateman, and a collaboration between uh, the J Japanese and Australians. There are two major groups now who have a blood test in the works that should be around hopefully within a few years, or maybe a year or so. so um, Intervene with plaque formation a decade or more before symptoms arise. Let's treat Alzheimer's the way we treat cancer and heart disease. Don't wait for symptoms. Know it's coming. Treat the pathology then and nip it. That's all fine, but we'll get to, in a moment, what do we do for patients who already have the disease? This is too late for them. I also want to just make a point um, that we know where plaques form, and it's very interesting. This is just, just something to think about, kind of a fun fact, right? The plaques actually form in something called the default mode network. How many of you heard of the default mode network? Cool. So this is, default mode network is basically what creates you, your ego, your personality. Um, it's active when you're daydreaming, um, your mind is wandering. Actually, if you're judging other people, if you're determining who you are versus other people, it's what keeps you, you, you. When you're sleeping and you're in that slow wave sleep after dreaming, that's when it turns off. That's when your ego and your personality turns off, the default mode network turns off. So it turns out that the more active your default mode network is, the more plaques you make. So if you're daydreaming right now, you might want to stop. Um, and, but basically, you know, if, uh, if you're reading or doing a job or you're more task-oriented or more oriented on what you're doing in the moment, um, then you do better in terms of making plaques based on these data. Um, and since this is a, 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 a quote I used to show from George Carlin, the comedian who passed away recently, um, and now it's even more relevant. He said, an idle mind is the devil's workshop, and the devil is Alzheimer's. I don't know how he knew this, but an idle mind is basically when you're in the default mode network. So I thought that was just interesting that George Carlin, of all people, figured that out about 10, 15 years ago. So now we can say plaques lead to tangles. We also, I didn't show you this, but plaques, as we know in the mice, that can lead to neuroinflammation. <clears throat> but as tangles kill neurons and neurons die, that also triggers neuroinflammation. You can also get tangles without plaques by mutations that cause the frontal temporal lobar dementias, like Pick's disease, non-amyloid type dementias. But you can also get plaques, uh, or tangles like this. So bangs to the head, boxing. Um, you know, taking one too many hits or too many concussions on the football field, okay? Bangs to the head can get you directly to tangles and neuroinflammation without the need for plaques. So if we're treating CTE or, or frontal lobe dementias, plaques are not as important. You have to go directly to, to tangles, and as I'll explain later, neuroinflammation is the main target. So um, one of the things I've been doing um, is trying to figure out how to detect concussion better. So I started a company with some colleagues called React Neuro. Um, this is based on the fact there are 4 million concussions per year in this country. And many of them are not even detected. And in many cases, it gave me small injuries that are, that, that, that are similar. And it leads to um, a huge, huge amount of, of problem. Actually, it's a 6x more likely to have a second concussion once you have your first one. You see this in the NFL. I work with the Patriots on brain health in, in terms of trying to advise the players on their brain health and work directly with Coach Belichick on this problem because I figure if I'm going to watch football, knowing what I know, I'm going to try to give back and help these guys. And this is one of the reasons for developing this device. So this is when you get a concussion, you know, it's just, you just follow the finger, right? Um, so uh, Belichick makes the joke that as soon as these players come off the field with a concussion, you get the neurologist blessing them, you know? <laughs> so so um, 
Um, but basically, in this, uh, what you're going to see here is here's uh, one of my co-founder's eyes in the device. Um, and you're following a dot. Um, I, won't, I won't make you go through the whole thing, but there are four different tests that follows eye tracking. And then at some point, you actually have to move your head to get a dot into a circle. So that's the ocular vestibular um, response. So it does these four different tests as he's doing there. And then for each player, uh, or each, this could be an NFL player, or it could be a soccer mom with her, her kid that she just wants to keep track of how he's doing. Um, there are, you have the four different tests, and you get a score, which we call the brain health index, because most concussion effects are being caused by inflammation and direct detrimental effects on synapses. Um, and so you know, sorry, so, so you know what your score, score is, and then uh, at any given time, let's say you have uh, your, your kids playing soccer or football, uh, once a week you, you check and you see where he or she is at. So you keep track of how they're doing, because everyone's going to have their own baseline. No one's going to have the same exact score uh, where they start. So you're basically, over time, collecting data, tracking if you go off of your baseline. Whether, uh, so for each player, you would do that. Now, this is going to go beyond players. This will go to people we believe that if, if our hypotheses are right, this could be part of a blood pressure cuff for the brain, that by assessing these eye movements and vestibular ocular movement, the question will be, if, as we collect data, could this be an indicator of just overall inflammation in the brain, even if you're not concussed or if you're not ill? So this is to be seen as we collect data. So in the end, what we want to do then is uh, detect early, in intervene early, but we also have to predict who's at greatest risk. Um, these are some of the various Alzheimer's genes that we and others have found um, over the past uh, um, 10, 20 years, shown here. But the fastest growing group of Alzheimer's genes are in the neuroinflammation category. Genes that are expressed in cells called microglia that, let me just tell you a little bit about them. So microglial cells normally are housekeeping. Uh, when you're in deep sleep, they, I like to think of remember the Scubby Bubble commercial? They're like Scubby Bubbles. They're cleaning up debris and taking care of the brain. That's what I, I like to call deep sleep mental floss. So when you're cleaning your brain out. So you have to get lots of sleep. Um, if these same little cells, they also act as sentinels, sense that neurons are dying, they go back to a program that's tens of thousands of years old that say, there's an infection, there's something wrong, wipe out the area. Inflammation says, wipe out this part of the neural grid, it's in trouble. So while they're wiping out neurons that have been compromised by friendly fire or collateral damage, they're killing neurons around it. That's neuroinflammation, okay? And as it turns out, if you look at what are called resilient brains, what's a resilient brain? People, this is very rare, but people who die in their 80s or 90s, and on autopsy, they have tons of plaques and tangles. And the pathologist says, this must have been an Alzheimer's patient. Say, so, nope, no cognitive problems when they died. And then what you find in these resilient brains, no dementia, despite abundant plaques and tangles. If you see uh, here, uh, here's AD, here's a resilient brain, lots of plaques, lots of tangles. The, in the AD case, you see the activated glia, neuroinflammation. In the resilient brains, you don't. So in the AD, they're losing neurons. In the resilient brain, you don't. It's neuroinflammation that kills 10 times or more cells than the plaques and tangles. So I like to say from these data, the plaque lights the match, the tangles are like brush fires that spread, but you can live with them. But it's the forest fire, neuroinflammation, it has flam in it, like a forest fire. It's the forest fire that takes you out and gives you dementia. And the problem with the amyloid trials was we were trying to put out a forest fire by blowing out the match. We had to do that long ago. So that's how things have to change. So this is what we, we've been learning. So now we have to, now the dish I showed you already had plaques and tangles, but we didn't have neuroinflammation. So just um, this past month in Nature Neuroscience, we published a new improved Alzheimer's in a dish that includes these little red cells here, the dyed red, are the microglial cells. So in the middle, you have the brain organoid making plaques and tangles, the green, and the microglial cells are outside. And if they sense something's wrong in here, there's microfluidic channels, they come marching in and they start attacking. So for the first time, we can visualize and track neuroinflammation in a dish. And of course, this means it's much easier now to find drugs or compounds to stop neuroinflammation. 
So let me show you what's happening. So if you look up here, um, that's a microfluidic channel. The microglial cells here, the brain organized here, this microglial cell, see how he's just hanging out? He doesn't care. He's like, he doesn't, wait, he doesn't want to go in, right? Can you just, I have to click this again to get it going? There we go. So he's just hanging out. But watch this guy over here. This guy is in an Alzheimer's culture. That's a normal culture. He's smelling plaques, tangles, and cell death. Look at him. They're rushing into the party. And this is what they do when they get in. This is a neuron. This is all in a dish, human neuron. That's the axon. That's the nerve ending of synapse. Look at these red guys, what they're doing. They're doing what you, what you did just about 45 minutes ago. They're having lunch. These microglial cells are eating that axon. Watch over here. See that spring back? We'll do it again. The little boing. Somewhere outside of the frame of this film, microglial cells ate a synapse and disconnected an axon and it sprung back in the dish. So in this way, we can actually visualize microglial cells that are starting to just wipe out an area as part of neuroinflammation. And we induce them to do so simply by having the neurons make plaques and tangles. So that means now we can test for drugs to stop plaques, or stop tangles, or stop tangles despite plaques, or stop plaques and thus tangles, but also drugs that would stop these microglial cells from being enraged terrorists and bring them back to being housekeepers and sentinels. Does that make sense? So that's what we've been doing. We have a whole slew of different drugs. We set up a screen to do that, automated screen. We now have probably about 60 drugs half of which are approved drugs that either affect plaques, tangles, or neuroinflammation. And one of the drugs that came up in the screen, um, uh, these are just showing how we test them um, for plaques versus tangles, et cetera. But um, one of the drugs that came up in the screen but was being worked on independently in parallel at a company in town called AZ Therapies is an old asthma drug called chromalin. And chromalin was remarkably able to take those microglial cells that were eating neurons and instead make them housekeepers again. And because you're making them housekeepers, they start eating plaque. So that's the nice thing about a drug that stops neuroinflammation is it converts the microglial cell from a killing machine back to a housekeeper that's gonna actually remove the plaque for you. As you remove amyloid, you also stop tangle production based on the first dish I showed you. So chromalin, uh, you know, the way they, they use it for asthma, you couldn't use it for Alzheimer's because it doesn't get into the brain. But AZ therapies developed a way to get chromalin um, as a micronized powder into the brain. And um, we've already published a paper in mice showing that it does exactly what we thought. It's, it's converting the microglial cells from the neuroinflammatory state to clearing amyloid. And then the phase three trial is ongoing. And uh, hopefully within the next year or so, we'll hear the results. But very optimistic um, about uh, hearing the results. This is the first drug it's actually hitting the neuroinflammation rather than plaques and tangles, which is most relevant for treating patients who are demented right now. You could also use it preventatively. And for transparency, I am an advisor and a shareholder in AZ therapy, so I have to say that along the way. Um, so here we go. Here's where we're at. Um, and by the way, I, I was given 45 minutes for my talk, so if you think I'm going over, I, it's, it's because they nicely gave me 45 minutes, so that's so thank you for that. So I don't want you to think that I'm abusing my time. Um, um, so anyway, we have, you can have drugs that stop the plaques. You can have drugs that stop the tangles, even if the plaques are still there. And then other drugs and combinations where we can stop neuroinflammation here. And so you can think about maybe a, a cocktail of drugs that hit these different things, both for prevention and for treatment. But I would have to say the Alzheimer's and the DISH models have just accelerated things tenfold since we first started using them, and others are using them around the world since 2014. Now, I want to mention another new paper we just published in Neuron over the summer because it says we have to be careful. For drugs to hit here, hitting the amyloid, right, um, it turns out that uh, we have good evidence now that amyloid is not just junk, that the amyloid is being made in the brain for a reason. And when we're using drugs to hit amyloid, we want to turn it down but not wipe it out. And here's why. Amyloid, as it turns out, is an antimicrobial peptide. I don't know why this is doing it. There we go. Antimicrobial peptide. So everybody thinks about the immune system in terms of antibodies and adaptive immunity. You get an infection. Your B cells and T cells kick up. 
you make antibodies, you fight it. But what keeps you alive while the adaptive immune system is getting its act together is innate immunity. And the foot soldiers of innate immunity are these tiny little peptides, LL37, defensins, et cetera, et cetera, and they recognize bacteria, viruses, yeast, fungus, even cancerous cells, and they glom onto the bacteria. Usually these peptides are right around the size of amyloid beta protein. They're charged like amyloid beta. They have the same alpha helix beta sheet combination. And they glom onto the bacteria, and they entrap it to keep it away from host cells. So that's how you, if you have, for example, if you didn't have LL37, if you, have, if you were, uh, uh, were born with gene mutations and knocked out LL37, you die by one and a half years old because that one antimicrobial peptide has to protect you against infection while your adaptive immunity kicks in. And we know that there are at least three different antimicrobial peptides that cause amyloids. There's one that causes it in the eye, lactoferrin, one that causes it in seminal vesicles, one that causes it in the aorta, lactoferrin. So there's a precedent for antimicrobial peptides that are known to bind to proteins and viruses and entrap them in, a, in a, what's called an extracellular trap or net to cause amyloids. Well, it turns out, and this is the work of Rob Moyer in my group. Um, he's an Australian scientist, and he once worked with Barry Marshall. Everyone, anybody know who Barry Marshall is or what he's famous for? So Barry uh, got the Nobel Prize for discovering the helobacter pylori, helicobacter pylori cause ulcers. And no one believed the guy, so he drank helicobacter pylori and gave himself an ulcer. So some people would do anything for a Nobel Prize. But, um, but, but Rob trained with him. So he was trained to, to kind of think out of the box. I like to say, Rob thinks so far out of the box, he has not seen the box yet. So he's the one who came up with this idea that amyloid may be a good guy doing this. And I'll just show you the evidence quickly. These are all the different models, um, the Alzheimer's in a dish, C. elegans nematodes, Drosophila, and multiple mouse models. In every case, if, the, if you, um, give a salmonella infection or a herpes infection, or in the case of Drosophila, yeast infection, if they're making amyloid, if they've been genetically engineered to make excess beta amyloid, they're protected and they live longer. Amyloid protects against infection. And this is uh, um, probably most important, is herpes. There was a paper at the same time of ours, as ours from Mount Sinai, from Joel Dudley's group, showing that in the Alzheimer's brain, there's abundance amounts of herpes viruses that that correlate with the clinical severity of the disease. In particular, HSV1, that's the cold sore herpes, but also, even more so, HHV6, HHV7. These are the viruses that cause roseola. So you know, you know when a baby gets that red rash? Almost all of us as babies get roseola, the little red rash, the parents freak out. Well, that virus, HHV6 and 7, then goes to the brain, integrates into neurons, and stays dormant in the genome. It can be activated again. And in Alzheimer's, what, what the Mount Sinai group found was that they're more prone to having that virus reactivated in the brain. What we found in our parallel paper in Neuron was that once that virus uh, gets made, or, or herpes simplex virus as well gets made, amyloid starts to form. In fact, any pathogen, yeast, listeria bacteria here, salmonella here, herpes here, see all this web stuff, like spider webs? That's all amyloid where the microbe took the little peptide and instantly induced the formation of a plaque around it. So in an Alzheimer's mouse, it takes about five or six months before you see a plaque. If we take a one-month-old mouse and inject herpes virus into it, into the brain, plaques overnight. So this whole paradigm that plaques take 10 years to form and it's a slow process, wrong. If you seed the plaque with a microbe, instant plaque. And the plaque is acting as a trap for these microbes. So I showed you before the genetics, right, where you had that A beta 42, the long A beta, that was seeding the plaque. In that case, you don't need a microbe. They have a genetic mutation that leads to more of the longer A beta that seeds plaque all the time. But 99% of people, those mutations are absent. So is it possible then that microbes are seeding plaques in, the other, in, in, in a good amount of Alzheimer's patients? This is something now that we're pursuing. This is just showing what I told, what just told you about herpes being able to rapidly seed beta amyloid in the brain as a plaque to protect the brain 
against infection. So to summarize this part, amyloid turns out is useful as an antimicrobial peptide, low grade infections, not causing clinical symptoms, seed amyloid instantly as an antimicrobial peptide response to protect the host cells from the microbe. The plaques are analogous to extracellular traps. They're also called nanonets that are formed by classic antimicrobial peptides to trap and then kill the invading microbes. And then we can show proof of concept of this in animals and in our 3D cultures. So the question is, what microbes are living in our brain? So most people are taught that the brain is sterile, right? To hear microbes in the brain sounds crazy. Well, our brains are not sterile. Um, in fact, our brains have its own microbiome. You've heard of the gut microbiome. As we now use the same type of techniques of, uh, of uh, what are called, well, these are just some of the, first of all, just some of the papers that have been published, herpes in the brain, yeast, bacterial infections. Many of the genes we have found actually directly control viral infection. In fact, see this gene? This is one of the newest Alzheimer's gene, PILRA. The main mutation in that, which is, reaches full genome-wide significance, is an amino acid change in this protein that dramatically protects you against Alzheimer's disease. So it's a protection variant. And what it does when you test that mutation is it prevents herpes from infecting neurons. So I mean, the data are there. The evidence is just mounting. It takes a long time to convince the field of a new paradigm. But this is something we have to pay attention to. Um, and so what we're doing now is we're taking brain. We're doing what's called metagenomic sequencing. The same way you, you look at the gut microbiome and the composition of bacteria, um, our colleagues at Mount Sinai are looking at the viral component, the virome of the brain. We are now looking at the bacteriome of the brain using metagenomic sequencing. And this is just to show you that we're not crazy, well, most of the time. Um, this, each one of these columns is a brain. These first 10 are brains from people who died between 30 and 40 years old, usually catastrophically, like a car accident. Then these are 60 to 90-year-old people each one, that don't have Alzheimer's. And then this is Alzheimer's cases, age 60 to 90. Now, each one of these colors it shows the percent or proportion of a bacterial species or genus that's living in that brain. So look at the young brain. See all the different colors? And get, get this, in the young brain, a lot of those bacteria, this is unpublished data, OK? So we have to validate it, but I'm just giving you a sneak preview. In the young brain, a lot of these bacteria are actually beneficial bacteria, like the ones you have in your gut. Pro, pro, uh, so these are probiotic bacteria that produce things like butyrate that protect you against inflammation. Like when you, you know, we talk about um, more important than probiotics for your gut, you want to have fiber, right? Prebiotic fiber, because fiber feeds the bacteria you have. When bacteria start to digest fiber, like from whole wheat, oatmeal, peas, lentils, legumes, that causes the release of, 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 uh, of chemicals like butyric acid that go to the brain through the brain-gut uh, connection, vagal nerve, and that butyric acid protects against inflammation. Now we're seeing in, that in young brains, we see the same bacteria in the brain. How are they getting in there? I don't know. By the time you get to 60-plus people, those bacteria go away. The probiotic bacteria are basically gone. So if, this is in this pilot-level study. And by the time you get to Alzheimer's disease, look at what happens. Look at that baby blue. It's, it's dysbiosis. And these AD brains, this baby blue guy, there's one here, is taking over. That's a bacteria that lives in fingernail dirt. And it's really funny because I did a Dr. Oz show, which is always dangerous. And, um, and I was explaining how this antimicrobial things work, and I was putting Play-Doh on a brain and explaining it. And then Dr. Oz said, oh, so our mothers are right. We have to be careful. We have to keep our hands clean. I said, well, and this is like before I knew any of this stuff. I said, well, we have no idea. All we know is amyloid can form in response to microbes. And we, don't have, we have no idea what microbes are in the brain doing this yet. And he said, yeah, but I mean, you don't want to pick your nose. <laughs> and I said, so you know, making a joke, I said, yeah, my mother said never pick your nose. And everybody's laughing in the audience. And now here, <laughs> here it is like eight months later after the show, and the first bacteria that shows up in high percentage grows in fingernail dirt. So I'm never going to doubt the great Oz anymore <laughs> after, after that. But anyway, that was uh, just an interesting um, um, 
little set of events. So we're pursuing this to see what, what's up with these bacteria. Now, there's always a chance of contamination, right? I mean, I, like when we do this, there's a chance, you know, we don't know if these bacteria are actually in the brain, are they outside the brain, can they be on the lab glass? But when we're seeing these consistent patterns that are different, this gives us confidence that we're seeing something that differentiates AD. So we keep going with this. Okay, now, so now I'll add to all of these different intervention points. I'll add here's your plaques, maybe herpes, all the microbes triggering them. Maybe there's a future for antivirals, antibiotics, immunization for stopping that part. Okay, now in the last few minutes, um, you know, besides needing a cocktail that's going to hit all these different pathologies, um, I like to use the acronym SHIELD, shield your brain for what you need to do in your life to help stave off neuroinflammation, particularly neuroinflammation. S stands for sleep, sleeping eight hours. Like I said, this is when you clean the brain out of amyloid and other debris. H stands for handle stress, meditation, relaxing, because chronic stress can lead to um, inflammation in the body, and as it turns out, in the brain, at least in mice, we have to see how that works out in humans. I is interact with others. Loneliness is a risk factor for Alzheimer's. Not living alone, but if you're lonely, and that's been shown over and over. Exercise, I'm going to show you more on, but exercise, I'm going to show why it's great for your brain in a moment, based on a new paper we just published in Science last week. Learn new things. So right now, I'm protecting you, because you're learning new things, unless I'm putting you to sleep, and I'm still protecting you. So that's the good thing. Um, and then, and then uh, diet, in fact, it was very nice to see that we, the diet we had here today it was actually a Mediterranean diet, and it's very good for you. So you're getting protected all around today by uh, this event. Um, and this is the problem, I, I, you know, when I write these books about this stuff with Deepak, I always say, this is the real mind-body problem. The mind says, get up. The body says, no, right? So, so what do we do about that? I mean, uh, we did a study in mice, I'm going to show you in a moment, where we allowed the mice to exercise. And they run, when you give a mouse a running wheel, even an Alzheimer's mouse, they run for four hours straight at night. Four hours straight, they don't stop. So whatever I show you about exercise, we could never do that much exercise as a mouse. So I'm going to show you how we had to figure out what exercise does and how we can bottle it. And that's how I'm going to end my talk. Um, so this is the paper that just came out in Science um, uh, last week. Um, these are just some of the articles that people wrote about it, if the pill could work. But I'm going to show you now the, the data. Um, so the idea behind this study was um, Adult neurogenesis. So it turns out that in the hippocampus of the brain, you continue to make new nerve cells. It's called neurogenesis your whole life. So the question was, in Alzheimer's mice, how does neurogenesis, if we block it or induce it, affect their cognitive ability? These are mice who are already having dementia and cognitive problems due to the Alzheimer's genes. And what we found was that if we used drugs or gene therapy to just directly induce neurogenesis, the mice didn't get better, didn't help. Neurogenesis didn't help. But the other way you can induce neurogenesis is exercise. Exercise is known to induce neurogenesis. Rusty Gage showed that a decade ago. If you have them exercise to induce neurogenesis, you reverse cogn cognitive impairment in these mice. But remember, they're running four hours a night, right? So, it's, it's, you know, so we said, well, what's going on? And what we found was that exercise it doesn't only induce neurogenesis, but increases levels of this protective factor called BDNF. Bottom line is that when you induce neurogenesis in a battleground with inflammation, the stem cells die. The new neurons can't live. It's like being born in a battleground. But exercise also induces BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which protects those nerve cells so they can live. They then mature. We show all this in the paper. Become nerve cells. And then these mice get better. You can reverse their cognitive impairment. So then, um, so what we did was we used a combination of drugs or gene therapy that would both induce neurogenesis, but at the same time turn up BDNF. And that's how we were able to show with just two different drugs or two different gene therapies together, we could mimic the effects of exercise. Um, and it wasn't enough just to induce neurogenesis. It wasn't enough just to induce BDNF. You have to have it together. Neurogenesis causes the new stem cells to, to grow as neurons. BDNF is like the fertilizer that allows them to grow. And then you reverse cognition impairment in the mice. Now we have to think about how to do this safely in humans. We can talk about that. So I'm going to end with uh, this final um, uh, comment. Move more, learn more, sleep more, relax more, meditate more, eat better and less, that's me, and choose your ancestors wisely. So this is how to avoid Alzheimer's. And then this is my crew uh, who do all this work and Cure Alzheimer's Fund funds me. Thank you very much for your attention.
Any questions? Oh, is there time for questions? Oh, cool. Good. I know it's a lot of information, and you're, it's always tough to get questions when your mind is stuffed with information, so I apologize. It's a wonderful talk. Uh, thank thank you. you so much for that. Um, that dysbiosis that you showed in the, in the Alzheimer's patients, do you have any theory as to what might be causing that? Yeah. So the virus in the, in the Mount Sinai paper, the virus that was most abundant in the Alzheimer's brain is, was HHV6, the roseola virus. It turns out that when you, when you look at where the virus was integrated in the neurons, the integration site in the genome determined how fast it could be activated or how readily it could be activated. So it wasn't so much like the Alzheimer patients had the virus but the others didn't. It's that the virus was more activated in the Alzheimer's patients, which had to do with integration in the genome, but could also have to do with integration of, uh, also have to do with lifestyle, because in many cases, the virus was integrated around sites that are induced by inflammation. So as you're getting older and there's more inflammation in the brain, it was also inducing the activation of those viruses based on where they were integrated. So that says that if you want to try to tackle this, you know, you could think about primary prevention hitting that virus with an immunization. You could think about drugs that prevent its replication, drugs that prevent its activation, like antivirals. Um, all that could be um, uh, thought of going forward. We also know that it's going to be a whole host of different microbes involved. It's not going to be one microbe. There's a fellow out there, Leslie Norris, is offering a million dollar prize to find the microbe that, that, that causes Alzheimer's. And I said, well, if we find 20, do we get $20 million? Because it's going to be more than one. But, uh, but HHV6, HSV1, big players. Bacterially, it's just one um, uh, species of micrococcus that we're finding so far. Thank you, Professor Tanzi. That was a fantastic talk. Thank you. Um, two questions. One is, is the, is the presence of plaques, uh, tangles, and inflammation, are all three necessary in terms of the onset of Alzheimer's disease or progression of Alzheimer's disease? That's what I took away from it. The second is if you look at some of the brain indications that are non-AD related dementias, for example, CADASIL or CTE in some of those areas, where you see deep brain inflammation, yeah. but you may not necessarily see the same sort of um, symptoms. That's exactly right. So for it to be Alzheimer's disease, as Alzheimer described it in August Dieter, you know, over 100 years ago, you need plaques, tangles, and neuroinflammation. But the resilient brain say to get dementia of any type among Alzheimer's and other non alzheimer dementias, you need neuroinflammation. So the route to neuroinflammation in Alzheimer's is plaques, tangles. Plaques cause some neuroinflammation. Tangles caused by the plaques kill neurons. Neurons die and cause neuroinflammation. Then you have 40 other genes that, that determine your neuroinflammation set point. Then you have your lifestyle, how much sleep you're getting. Are you eating junk food? Are you eating well? The whole shield thing. So then the combination of your other genes, whether you're following shield in your life or not, then determines your inflammatory set point given how many plaques and tangles you've formed during your life. So all of us are making plaques and tangles after 40 to some extent. But the question is, how, when will neuroinflammation be triggered in you? And that's going to be a combination of your lifestyle and your, and your genetics. Now, in CTE, you can get inflammation due to tangles just because it bangs to the head, no need for amyloid. In other diseases like those you mentioned, you don't even need tangles. You just need neuroinflammation. It's neuroinflammation that gets you to dementia. The root of how you get there determines the disease. Thank you. So my question is, the, there's a lot of talk of milk, ice cream, and cheese causing Alzheimer. Is there a Trouble. connection? And then second, you mentioned that women tend to get more Alzheimer. Is it just that they live to the point where they get to the age where Alzheimer starts to happen? So the they, they just live yeah. more. Yeah, the second question I can address, uh, women get more Alzheimer's after you already correct for lifestyle, I mean lifespan. So it's not just women living longer. And it turns out that women in MS studies, studies of multiple sclerosis, that, that women are more prone to um, uh, neuroinflammation and, and MS. So the question is what makes women more prone to neuroinflammation than, than men, I don't, and we really don't know. The first, in terms of milk, cheese, and that stuff, um, I mean, you know, if you have a high cholesterol diet, 
what's good for the heart's good for the brain, what's bad for the heart's bad for the brain. So there, if you have a lot of fat and cheese, your cardiovascular health will affect your neurovascular health, and then you can have stroke and stroke-related dementia, but also strokes can eventually also lead to Alzheimer's-type pathology down the line. You, get, you see them correlating. Okay, I think I'm the last question. Um, I don't know. <laughs> so I just noticed that some of the genes that were listed in the neuroinflammation category, yeah. um, somewhere in the middle of your talk, uh, are also genes implicated in autism. And I was curious if you were aware of or were looking into any of the overlaps between neuroinflammation involved in autism and that in Alzheimer's. We are. I mean, we work a little bit on autism as well, but it, also in depression, um, schizophrenia, we have a neuroinflammatory component. So it wouldn't be surprising that innate immune genes overlap and play roles in both. Yeah. Yeah. So a quick one. Uh, you mentioned uh, the default mode network, and I think you suggested that in some people the, that network is more active. Well, if you're engaging in what turns on the default mode network, then you know that was more of just a passing thought, just the idea that amyloid, it's interesting that amyloid follows the default mode network, and so if you look at the different activities that activate that network, you have to ask, does that trigger amyloid? Just, just, this is just more of a hypothesis, disconnection hypothesis of Alzheimer's, as it's called. Anyway, I see that as well. I'm going to talk about it soon. Oh, cool. Great. Thank you. Okay. All right, cool. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>